joining us by means of Facebook today as well. Um, we would love to know that you have joined us, and so please either like us or put a comment in the comment box. Today is, is Holy Trinity Sunday, a, a day that gives us opportunity to look at our, our triune God. And, and even though there are those challenges, those difficulties of, of just how we can fit that reality of three persons, one Godhead, into our human reason and into our rational thought, it doesn't mean we shouldn't think about it. And today we have that opportunity to think about it and how God, in revealing himself as our triune God, is a tremendous comfort for us because we see that our salvation is securely in his hands. We'll be following the order of service that is printed in the service bulletin. And please note that we will sing Verses 1 through 4 of our first hymn, we'll stand for the singing of verse 4, and then we'll have the confession absolution, and after the confession absolution, we will sing verse 5. God's blessings on your worship. God's own child, I'll gladly say it. I am baptized into Christ. Gave my full redemption price. Do I need earth's treasures many? I have one worth more than any that brought me salvation free, lasting to eternity. Stir my soul no longer, I am baptized into Christ. I have come forth even stronger, Jesus' cleansing sacrifice. Should a guilty conscience seize me, being flood. Sprinkling me with Jesus' blood. Satan, hear this proclamation. I am baptized into Christ. Drop your ugly accusation. I am not so soon enticed now that to the font I've traveled my task come unraveled and against your tyranny God my Lord unites with me You cannot end my gladness, I am baptized into Christ. When I die, I leave all sadness to inherit paradise. divine to make life immortal mine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, 
and his word has no place in our lives. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. On account of Jesus' saving work for you, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is nothing worth comparing to this lifelong comfort sure. Open night my grave is staring, even there I'll sleep secure. Though my flesh awaits its raising, still my soul continues praising. I am baptized into Christ. I'm a child of paradise. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Enter in with thanksgiving. You are a great and a wondrous God, copying in your hands all the depths of earth. You made the hills and the mountains high. You made the seas and the dry land. Thanksgiving. Come, let us worship and bowing low. Kneel before the one who has made us all. You are the God whom we call our own. We are the flock that you shepherd. Thanksgiving. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. We read verses 1 through 8. And here Isaiah is given a glimpse of our triune God. And we hear 
the seraphim cry out and sing, Holy, holy, holy. Three holies to speak of that trinity, but also three holies to emphasize our God's holiness. It's no wonder that sinful Isaiah would feel that he's doomed in the presence of one who is so holy. And yet, we hear how the burning coal is brought to his lips, purifying him. A picture of the fact that we, those who believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, can have confidence to stand before our triune God on the last day because we have been purified by the blood of God the Son. We read, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of the one who called, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, I am doomed. I am ruined, because I am a man with unclean lips, and I dwell among a people with unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies." Then one of the seraphim flew to me, carrying a glowing coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with the coal and said, Look, this has touched your lips, so your guilt is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. This is the word of our God. We join together in singing Psalm 63, which we find on page 9 and 10 and 11 in the service bulletin. <coughs> in the morning I will sing, I will sing glad songs to you, I will sing glad songs of praise to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. <laughs> oh God, you are my God, for you I long. strength and your glory. In the morning I will sing, I will sing glad songs to you, I will sing glad songs of praise to you, I will sing glad songs of praise to you. For your love is better than life. My lips will speak your praise. So I will bless you all my life. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul shall be filled as with a banquet. My mouth shall praise you with joy. my bed I remember you on you I muse through 
the night, for you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings I rejoice, my soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. Our second lesson comes to us from the book of Romans, chapter 8. We read verses 14 through 17. And again, we see our triune God. It is God the Son, who through his life, death, and resurrection, has made us children of the Heavenly Father. Because the Holy Spirit has worked faith in our hearts to believe in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, we are able to call God the Father, Abba, Father, a term of endearment. We read, Indeed, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery so that you are afraid again, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we call out Abba, Father. The Spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, since we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of our God. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Alleluia. We continue with our next hymn. the fire of love, the soul's anointing from above, your light to every thought impart, love in every heart, mortal stay. With deathless light invigorate, drive far away our wily foe.
we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. We turn our attention on this Holy Trinity Sunday to our lesson from John chapter 16. We read verses 12 through 15. I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I said that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. This is the word of our God. Sometimes there are people who accuse the Bible of not being relevant today. And I suppose if we are being honest with ourselves, we might even have to admit that there are times that we have set God's word aside or maybe never picked it up and read it because we just didn't think it had a whole lot of value for us. And perhaps the words that we just read may have brought about such a thought in our mind. But if that is the case, we need to dismiss such a thought immediately. You see, even though the biblical teaching of the Trinity is, is not one that we can fully grasp with our human reason, it does not mean that it does not have practical value for us. For do you realize when it is that Jesus spoke these words? He spoke these words to his disciples at a time that they needed desperately the strengthening of their faith. They needed comfort and assurance and security. So yeah, these words have practical value for us today. And note how it is that Jesus begins this section. He says, I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. Things were tough for those disciples right then and there. They were trying to come to grips with Jesus' words that had said to them that he was going to go to Jerusalem, suffer at the hands of the religious leaders, and die. They were trying to come to grips with Jesus' words that told them that he was going to depart. Oh, Jesus had more that he wanted to say to them, but because their hearts were weighed down with that anxiety and that sorrow, now was not the time. So, so what does Jesus do? He comes to them with a message that speaks about the intricate workings and relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Tell me, are there any days of your life that you need the strengthening of faith, comfort, assurance, or security? Well, if you're anything like me, you need it only every day. That means that these words are for you. It means that they have practical value for your believing hearts today. And not just in the general sense that the only true God is the triune God, but these words come to you for the strengthening, for the strengthening of faith, for comfort and assurance and security. They come to you speaking to your hearts and to your minds, to your bodies and souls that are weighed down by sin and its effects. And it does so by reminding us and assuring us that our salvation rests securely in the hands of our triune God. Now, as Jesus weaves his way in and out of the words of our, of our lesson here, 
Notice, he, he never tries to explain the Trinity in such a way as to satisfy the demands of human reason. It's just not possible. Instead, he comes to us with the wonderfully comforting truth that each person of the Godhead is equally involved in the work of our salvation. And so, so he says, everything that belongs to the Father belongs to me. Now just put yourself in the shoes of those disciples that day and, and see what they saw. There in front of them, the one speaking to them is Jesus, true man with flesh and blood. He has just told them that he is going to depart. He's going to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer and die, and then he's going to go away. And so, yeah, their hearts were weighed down. They were disappointed. They were anxious. Their faith would have been wobbling because at this time they didn't understand that it was for their benefit. But Jesus, he didn't want them to not understand. He didn't want them to be afraid. And so he says, everything the Father has is mine. That means that Jesus is just as powerful, just as holy, just as all-knowing, just as eternal as God the Father. He is equal to the Father in every way. This meant that the man that they saw standing right there before them was more than just their friend, more than just their teacher, more than a moral individual, more than just a man with flesh and bones. This was true God. And as true God, it had to mean that his suffering, death, and departure had to be part of God's plan. And when we look at the will of God the Father, we see that to be the case. For, for what is God the Father's will? Well, God the Father's will is that all people would come to know the truth of salvation in Jesus Christ, would repent of their sins and be saved. That means that this was Jesus' will too. God the Father's will was to bring salvation into this world through the gift of his only begotten Son. And therefore, Jesus came into this world with the express purpose of suffering, dying, and rising again to bring about that salvation. And that is what we needed him to do. We needed Jesus to be our Savior, truly man and truly God. We needed him to be our way to heaven, to live for us the holy life that God demands, to live the type of life that we aren't able to live, and to pay the price that we could never pay. We needed Jesus to be condemned and punished in our place. And that's what Jesus had been telling his disciples all along. That's what the Bible is, is all about. We needed Jesus to shed his holy blood on the cross. We needed Jesus to offer up his holy life into death as the ransom price that would pay the penalty for our sins and buy us back from sin, death, and the devil. We needed Jesus to carry out his heavenly Father's will. And that is exactly what he did. And that is why Jesus could say, everything the Father has is mine. But Jesus doesn't stop there in coming to us and explaining this inner working of the Trinity. He continues, and he continues by saying, everything that belongs to me belongs to the Spirit. For he says, this is why I said that he, and the he there that he's talking about is the Holy Spirit, that he takes from what is mine. So what has the Holy Spirit taken from Jesus? Well, one of the most important blessings that you and I need is something that rightfully only belongs to Jesus. Righteousness. Holiness. Perfection. You see, we, we need righteousness. We need perfection in order to have a right relationship with God. And that's because our sins, they separate us from God and they doom us to an eternity in hell. And so what we need 
is to have this right relationship with God, this perfectly close relationship with God, we need it to be restored. And the only way that is possible is with righteousness. Well, Christ is righteous. He always lived righteously. All those commandments that God gave to mankind, Jesus perfectly kept. He never did something that God said not to do. He never failed to do what God told him to do. He never even sinned in thought. He always put his heavenly Father first. And then Jesus took that holy life and he picked up all of your sin and all of my guilt, all of the sin and guilt of the entire world, and he put that onto his perfect shoulders and he carried it to the cross completely and willingly, just like God's word declares, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. And on the cross, Jesus suffered the torment of our hell. He endured the agony of our punishment. He underwent the complete and total separation from God the Father that our sins deserve. And on that cross, God the Father looked at his Son as if he was looking at each and every member of the human race. And on account of Christ's death, he declares the burden of everyone's guilt to be lifted away in forgiveness. So what belongs to Jesus is the forgiveness of sins. What belongs to Jesus is peace with God. What belongs to Jesus is righteousness. What belongs to Jesus is the way to heaven. And everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to the Spirit. But now understand, the Holy Spirit does not just take from Jesus so that he can just keep it for himself. Now Jesus goes on in our lesson to say that everything that belongs to the Spirit belongs to believers. Yes, you heard me right. Everything that belongs to the Spirit belongs to believers. For Jesus said, this is why I said that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. And again, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. This is a main point of these verses. The Holy Spirit takes the righteousness of Jesus and takes the forgiveness that he has won and he brings it to us. You see, you and I, we would never understand. We would not know anything about God, about Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, if it wasn't for the fact that the Holy Spirit gives and creates faith in our hearts. And doesn't that, once again, just highlight that tr truth that there is no way that we on our own could ever earn heaven? Doesn't it underscore that truth of the seriousness of our sins? For, in fact, when we look at our sinfulness, don't we have to cry out and admit, I don't even deserve to be knocking on heaven's door, let alone walk through heaven's door. And yet, through the gospel, that is the message of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that he's won, through that gospel in word and in baptism, the Holy Spirit has clothed us in Christ's righteousness when he brought us to faith. Through faith, he made us God's children as he applied the forgiving blood of Jesus to us. And now, our sins are completely washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, God sees us as his children. Now, we know the truth because the Holy Spirit has brought the truth to us. And that's what Jesus said would happen when he sent the Holy Spirit who would guide us into all truth. But just what exactly is truth? 
That's a question that Pontius Pilate asked, right? It's a question that's been asked throughout all of the centuries ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin. And the answer to that question is of vital importance. It's always been of vital importance. But maybe we need to be asking that and answering that question even more in our world today. For when our world seeks to answer that question, what is truth, what oftentimes does the world say? Ah, truth, it's all just relative. Which means, well, what's true for me is true for me. It might not be true for you, but don't tell me what's true for you if it's not true for me. You see, our world doesn't think that there is such a thing as absolute truth. But there is. And that absolute truth is found in God's word. And the truth is that we have fallen short of the perfection that God demands. The truth is we are unable to earn even a little bit of God's favor. The truth is that even now, as believers who have come to know and believe that we have God's favor through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the truth is we still sin, and that's not okay. But isn't it really easy to downplay our sin? I mean... We see the anger or the impatience in our lives, and what do we do? We excuse it by saying, ah, it's just the way that I am. There's that lust and immorality in this world, and we become part of it, and, and we excuse it by saying, well, it's just part of the world, and I can't help it. We, we set aside God's word and per, time for personal devotion, and we, we, we brush it off as being not that big of a deal, and we just don't have the time, but it is a big deal. In fact, every single one of those sins is deserving of punishment. But, but then again, remember, that's not where truth ends, is it? The truth is, God loves us so much that he, he wasn't going to allow us to spend an eternity in hell. And so God kept his promise to send and to sacrifice his son to pay for all of our sins. And so the truth is that through faith in Jesus, we are forgiven. The truth is that through faith in Jesus, we are God's children. The truth is that through faith in Jesus, there is relief for troubled consciences because the blood of Jesus Christ has paid for all of our sins. The truth is that Jesus has done absolutely everything for our salvation and he meets our every single need. You know, throughout your life of listening to sermons, maybe those, those years have been short, or maybe they've been many, but throughout your life of listening to sermons, you've probably heard sermons that kind of fall on, on one side or the other. And, and by that I mean probably ones that are, are of the practical nature or ones that are maybe more of the technical or we could maybe say doctrinal nature. And by that I mean the practical ones maybe are the ones you hear that are more like, do this, this is what Jesus did, follow his example, don't do that. And the doctrinal ones are more of the ones that say, well, here are the facts, the facts of creation, the facts of Holy Communion, or like today, the, the facts of our triune God. And as we listen to the words of our lesson here this morning, there, there's, there's no doubt that the words of our lesson today are much more of a doctrinal nature. But please, please do not think that they have no practical value. They do. For if you did not know the triune God, you would not know salvation. And if you did not know salvation, you would have to go through life absolutely terrified what happens at death and only have an eternity in hell to look forward to. But rejoice. Your God true God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has revealed himself to you. And now, the mystery of salvation is no mystery at all. And that's why the words of our lesson do indeed strengthen your faith, give you comfort and assurance and security, indeed praise God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please stand. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the Te Deum, the You Are God, We Praise You, that we find on page 13 and following in the service bulletin. We will join the refrain as a congregation, and then we will sing the following parts as they are listed. creation offers praise with the angels in heaven we praise you we praise you with the cherubim and seraphim we praise you we praise you with apostles and prophets With the martyrs and your holy church, you are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. You, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. Creator of all things, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we praise you, we praise you. O Spirit most holy, we praise you, we praise you. To the Trinity most blessed, Christ, King of glory, we praise you, we praise you. You became a man to set us free, we praise you, we praise you. You have risen to free us, we praise you, we praise you. And with all your saints in glory, Our God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. All creation offers praise. The congregation may be seated. At this time, we invite Heidi Geisler to come forward as she professes her unity and faith with us. Dear members of Faith Evangelical Lutheran Church, Heidi Geisler, having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desires to become a member of this congregation. Sister in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him on earth. You are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith and unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge that in baptism God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? I do. do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? I do. do you believe that the teaching of Faith Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from God's word and instruction class, is faithful and true to the word of God? I do. do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, 
Be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Heidi, may the Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, renew and increase in you the gift of the Holy Spirit to the strengthening of your faith, to your growth in grace, to your patience in trouble, and to the blessed hope of eternal life. For you can say with the psalmist, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Having heard your promises, we, the members of Faith Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, and invite you to join us in the reception of the Lord's Supper, share in our worship and mission, and participate in all the other blessings of salvation which God has given to his church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you joined this sister in Christ to your church when she was born again by the working of the Holy Spirit. In mercy you taught her your saving truth. Grant that she may offer herself as a living sacrifice to you as her spiritual act of worship. Transform her by the renewing of her mind so that she will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. The congregation is invited to stand. We continue on page 16 in the service bulletin with the Lord have mercy. In the morning, O oh Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, you established marriage for our good and commanded us to honor this holy estate. We rejoice with Aspen Bew and Jesse Amstein, who were united in marriage yesterday. O oh Lord, we confidently ask you, bless their marriage with self-sacrificing love and steadfast commitment. Help them to always make you the center and foundation of their marriage. Help them always to remember with thankfulness that you have united them. Cultivate in their hearts the spirit of forgiveness and service, and dwell in their hearts and in the home they are establishing, so that their lives and their marriage will glorify you. And dear Heavenly Father, on this Memorial Day weekend, we take time to thank you for the more than 200 years of blessings which you have showered upon our land. Thank you for your gifts of prosperity in days of peace, and protection in days of war. Thank you for our natural resources, our talents and abilities. Thank you for giving us freedom of worship and all the other freedoms we possess. We thank you for the men and women who have given their lives so that we might have these freedoms. As we move forward as a nation, bless our government, prosper the work of our hands, and especially enable us to fulfill our responsibilities as citizens of your kingdom of grace and citizens of this land. We pray these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Let us praise the Lord. Praise be to God. The Lord bless and keep you. Amen. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. Amen. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. You may be seated. There may have been those times in our lives where we have thought about some scriptural truth. And perhaps the Trinity is one of them, where we say, I, I just don't get it, and the more I think about it, the more I become confused, so I'm just not going to think about it at all. I can understand your, your line of thought, but I would encourage you to think about it. And the fact that we can't grasp every last detail of it with our human reason, we don't need to let it bother us. But we do want to think about how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each person of that Trinity, is equally involved in the work of our salvation. 
The Father, in love, sent His Son. The Son, in love, lived, died, and rose again for us. The Spirit, in love, brings that truth to our hearts, tears down the walls of unbelief, brings us to faith, and applies all that our Savior has done to, for us to us. How marvelous, how wonderful that all three persons of our triune God are so intimately involved in our salvation and how it assures us and strengthens us in knowing that our salvation is indeed securely in the hands of our triune God. A joy to, to worship with all of you here today. And once again, that special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today. We would love to have you sign our friendship register that you find on the square table in the gathering area. I'd also like to draw your attention to just a few things. First of all, um, as you saw here this morning, we received into membership um, our Christian sister Heidi. I, I ask that you please take time to, to welcome her after worship here today. And we pray that God would bring her here to be a blessing to us as, as we are a blessing to her as well. Continue to keep her and her family, as you see the names of her children there in the service insert. Um, please keep her and her family in your prayers. Um, please also note um, the first fish outing, our um, uh, group for adults, the first fish outing that, that really will be um, being held here at church ever since the, the pandemic hit. That's going to be June 12th, that's a Saturday, from 5 to 7. The information can be found there in the service bulletin. Um, also take note that coming up very shortly on Sunday, June 20th, we will be having our joint um, summer worship service and picnic. Um, that service will be at 10 o'clock just one service that day at 10 o'clock. It'll be here at our Black River Falls location. And following that service will be our picnic. The, the meat and the buns, the condiments, the drinks and the chips all provided for that day. Um, members are asked to bring either a salad or dessert and then plan to stick around, um, weather permitting, for some fun and games outside as well. And then I believe there is simply the announcement that the newsletter for the month of June can be found on the table, the white table in the gathering area. You can also find a few copies on the square table. If you happen to run out of them, I've got a few extra copies um, back here in my folder that I brought back from, from Cataract. And then finally, if you would just be patient and give me a one moment, we will also get our Wells Connection video up and we will watch May's edition of the Wells Connection. Um, God's richest blessings to all of you throughout this week and a blessed Memorial Day for you as well.
together. Um, you know, the devil is out there like a roaring lion, and if you're all alone, you're more susceptible. Being able to stay connected to your family and believers and to have that encouragement that you are not alone out there is invaluable. And when you're in a relaxed format, you can talk to all uh, questions that you may have had in the back of your mind for a while. The weekly gathering at the restaurant is part of a larger effort by Good Shepherd to use whatever means available to help members stay in fellowship and build a bridge back to in-person worship. We have people just reaching people, and it will help us fill those pews again. There's no replacement for being together in church. The efforts at Good Shepherd have been fruitful. As Sunday mornings are beginning to look more like they did in 2019. Good morning. Good morning. We present the pure gospel. And we present that message so clearly for them that they are eager to come back and be part of our family once again in public worship. It was quite a joy to see the worshipers that are here today. I saw lots of smiling faces. Since the beginning of the New Testament church, God's people have formed communities. We're meant to be together in Christ. And some aspects of community can't be replicated online. You miss them. Um, so being able to see those faces again and give that whole bumps and things like that, it's, it's just important. It's another level of connection that you don't always get through the online piece. You get to see the warmth and expressions of pure emotions of your fellow members uh, when you're in person and you miss that on the camera. Sharing our lives as part of a community, in person, in Christ. That's why we gather. This is 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 why we gather. To help you remind your fellow members about the blessing of in-person worship, Congregational Services has created a series of short videos designed to be easily shared on social media, titled, God's People Gather. You can find the videos on wellscongregationalservices.net. Thank you.